One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Dead, buried, cremated. Australia's basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. Data has been described by our next Politics in the Pub guest, Peter Lewis, as the new oil, or even the new uranium. The metaphor extends to the way that personal information is mined, processed, and used to power new forms of energy, such as personalised marketing, platforms that modify according to behaviour, and to create new smart algorithms. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has been facing questions this morning uh, from the US Senate Judiciary uh, so and So what does this commerce. mean for the millions of Australians who use Facebook and Mr Zuckerberg? We should be deleting this social media for the platform. The first time, now. 7.30 can reveal the big four banks disclosed 32 data breaches to Australia's privacy watchdog since We've shown you before the rising role that automation and robots play in some parts. Artificial intelligence is taking it further. The target right now and in the future, white-collar work. The government is computer- to make sure that it has a research, innovation and education system that creates new jobs and educates the workforce faster than the old jobs. You can't hang on to it. But the mining and manipulation of big data sits uneasily with the majority of Australians. The Australia Institute is delighted to announce the launch of its newest centre, the Centre for Responsible Technology, which found that three quarters of respondents are uncomfortable with platforms selling information to other businesses. Two thirds are uncomfortable with platforms tailoring products and services based on personal information, and more than half are uncomfortable with the government collecting facial recognition data, even when it's to verify child access to online content. The Centre for Responsible Technology is headed up by Peter Lewis, the founder of Essential Media and author of the book Webtopia on the worldwide wreck of tech. At our latest Politics in the Pub event, Peter Lewis led a panel discussion with tech and data experts Mark Andreevich, Professor of Media Studies at Monash University, and Pia Andrews, a driver of open government from inside the public sector for the past two decades. They discuss the challenges of massive harvesting of personal information when the public doesn't even really have a language about what's okay and what's not okay. I'll let you into a little secret. About a, a good decade ago, Ben actually came and worked for me for about 18 months and his job used to be to peddle the essential report around the press gallery and go on to Sky TV and try to convince people that black was white, as pollsters do, and um, cook up all sorts of mischief. And then um, I think the Greens got the balance of power and there was more um, important work to do. So in a way, we've come full circle and now I've got an opportunity to work with Ben through the Australia Institute, which I think is Australia's premier think tank, um, as Ben likes to call it, we think and we do. Um, And when this idea that we needed to create a voice for people in the way the world is changing around technology took um, germination in my head. There was only one organisation that I could imagine working with and that was the Australia Institute. And over the last couple of months as we've been pulling this together, um, the whole staff has been incredibly supportive. Um, So this is, for anyone here that supports the Australia Institute, this is your initiative as well. So which probably leads to the question, what the hell is this? Um, My starting premise, like many people, was that when we... When when the internet arrived, and I was a young journalist um, in the late 80s, um, it just was mind-blowing. You thought, this is going to change the world for the better. It was a self-evident good that if we could flatten hierarchies through the free flow of information, we'd all be better off. And like much in my generation, I think, you know, not everyone in the room is my generation. I can see some of you are a little bit older. Um, And we adapted as we went, but we bought into the dream. We all of us did. And we, we adapted whether it was working out how to use an email or 
you know, running our business through a website or keeping in touch with our family on Facebook. We bought it. Um, but I think we've hit a point where it stopped working for people. Um, and it's big and complex and not easy, but I think it's incumbent on all of us as citizens to unpack it. So I kind of wrote myself into this job. The book that I'll try to get a few of you to buy later is really about the journey of, of, of changing my mind about what, where technology was taking the world and then saying, well, what are we going to do about it? And, and my, my end point is that we've got to reimagine and, and, and reconnect with what the web offered, which was human connection and the energy that can flow from people working together and use that as a starting point and go from there. And we've had a fantastic day to day um, at the Australia Institute where a bunch of academics, activists, unionists, people from responsible business and people that have worked in government got together and kicked these ideas around. So the programs that will roll out over the next few months are really a product of the energy generated by people of goodwill. But anyone's invited to this party and unless we open the doors up to everyone, um, we'll continue on the path we're on. So I'll just give you my spiel on where I think we're up to and then I'll get much smarter people than me to help me unpack some of the, some of the questions that I've asked. So as I said, my starting principle is that network technology, the internet, the web, whatever you want to call it, has stopped working for people. Our public square is collapsing and it's being replaced by divisive echo chambers where we can't mediate common truths or even agree on our most existential challenges. Like climate denial still gets 50% of the time. What's going on? A new breed of global corporations on the rise which feeds off our personal information and repurposes it to manipulate us in the marketplace, control us as citizens and replace us as workers. And as we stare into our phones and share our outrage responses, we don't realise we're actually feeding the big machine and making the anger bubbles only deeper. We can't tweet our way out of this. We were told the web would give us the tools to control the world, yet we've never felt so disempowered as technology goes on its inevitable march. Um, so I, my proposition is we all need to look up from our screens now to protect our kids. Mine are going through digital puberty at the moment and it's not a pretty process. To protect our own personal information, to protect our industries, to protect our democracy. Um, and that's the modest objective of the Centre for Responsible Technology. So I reckon if we all just feel good about it, we can go home and it'll all be done. So as I say, I've spent a day with a group of incredible people, two of which are on the stage. Some of you who are observant might notice that one of them isn't Dr Julia Powles, but it's Dr Mark Andreevich, who I'll introduce in a moment, and Pia Andrews. So they were two of the leads today in our discussions about what the centre could be doing. We're thinking about four launch projects, one around healthy digital kids, one around defining what is good when it comes to the use of personal information, one understanding the impacts of AI on work, and the other one on rebuilding the public sphere. So discrete bits of work which we'll be rolling out over the next six months as we try to broaden our web to create a network of like-minded people who want to put people back in the centre of this incredible change the world's going through. Like I say, this isn't a one-speed conversation, so it is a real pleasure to discuss some of these issues with two very, very bright people who come from very different backgrounds. Pia Andrews, who's on my left, has been a driver of open government from inside the public sector for the past two decades. She's been involved in various open government, open data and open source communities and initiatives around the world. And she's my chapter five in the book, if you buy. <laughs> Dr Mark Andreevich didn't make my book, but I did get the comment after it was published, I think from one of his colleagues, that you haven't read anything, but I kind of agree with most of it, which was a real honour. So Mark is Professor of Media Studies at Monash University, where he leads the Automated Society Working Group, and he's a Chief Investigator 
on the recently announced ARC Centre for Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society, like the guys that are going to try to make sense of AI for us. So we'll talk a bit about that later. Um, he's also a member of the US Council for Big Data, Society and Ethics, funded by the NSF. So one of the golden rules of any campaign I've been involved in is defining objectives up front. So I want to ask both of you first, what do you think the problem we're currently trying to solve is? I'll start with Mark. Well, the big picture problem, I think, is reversing the relationship between the technology and the society. So there was a period when the hope was that the technology would solve many of the social and political problems that we were confronting. Uh, and there's uh, a description for that hope, or there are a number of descriptions of various degrees of antipathy. Uh, one of them describes it as the California ideology, this notion that with interactive, networked forms of communication, we'd actually be able to engage in constructive forms of communication that would allow us to bypass and in, in some sense do away with the hierarchical political and corporate structures that, that shaped life and that we would end up with a kind of spontaneous, self-generating mm. form of participatory uh, engagement in democracy. More recently, there's been the critical uh, description by Evgeny Morozov of solutionism, the notion that you know, whatever, whatever problem you come up with, if you just throw some tech at it, you can, you can solve it. In both cases, what happens is the... Uh, the tough work of doing politics uh, and negotiating and arguing and debating and so on it gets s given second place to a, a kind of wonder with the technology that actually maybe we can just set aside all of that and the technology will solve things. In practice, what that means is that we have endowed the tech sector with a lot of it's unaccountable and unfettered power. And, and in part, this is because we celebrate the economic uh, benefits in places like Silicon Valley and elsewhere that are driven by these uh, you know, during a period in developed nations of kind of post-industrial anxiety uh, to glom onto these tech companies as the, as the hope for the future has led, I think, to us endowing the engineers uh, and the folks who developed the technology with more power than perhaps we should be giving them. <laughs> and that's not to denigrate them, but it's to say that as a society, uh, when you develop technologies, you always have to think about from a social, political, mm. and cultural perspective how you want to shape the development of those technologies. If you leave it to just the market and the engineers, you will get outcomes that don't necessarily accord with the civic and social and cultural values of, mm. of uh, your country or your environment. And I, th I think we've found ourselves in that place. We've gone, wait, you know, we, we turned, uh, we endowed these um, technologies with a lot of power. Um, we didn't, I, I remember going to a conference, it had to be maybe seven or eight years ago, maybe a little bit more, when the question of privacy regulation came up. And there were a bunch of representatives from some of the big tech companies. And one of the things they said I thought was really interesting was, yeah, we don't, I mean, this has changed since that moment, but it, it characterizes that moment. Um, we don't really worry about that. They're so, the, the government and regulatory apparatus is so far behind us that they're never going to catch mm. up. <laughs> and that was, that's changed. They have tons of lobbyists now, and you know, they're worried and more anxious. But there was, you can remember that moment when it was, we're inventing mm. this, we're breaking things, we're moving fast, uh, and people can't keep up with us. And you know, there was a certain energy to that moment. But I think we then suffered this mo recent mm. backlash in the wake of Cambridge Analytica and Brexit and so on. So it's the asymmetry it, of power and of information between... Yeah, it's, it's a hypertrophied technological realm. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we have to, you know, that happens with the market sometimes. You have to say, you know, market's good, great, but it has to be subordinated to our political democratic imperatives. And I think the same thing mm. has to be said to, mm. for the development of the technology. Yeah. You come at from a slightly different um, oh, yeah. angle, but what do you see if you don't totally reject the premise of my I question, the problem that I we're trying to solve? I don't reject the premise. I, I just take a... So, as a supposedly highly powerful technologist, some of the most ethical people that I've worked with um, are technologists, particularly in the open source community, who, is, who ex explicitly understand the intersection between technology and freedom and technology and life. I mean, we are shaped by the tools that we use constantly, right? And, and part of the challenge is that 
as a whole society in certain cultures, particularly in this culture and, 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 and several others, <clears throat> most people outsource even thinking about technology. They outsource even thinking about data and people's eyes gloss over. I mean, the amount of times people are, oh, what do you work in tech? And their eyes either gloss or they don't. <laughs> their eyes either gloss or they're in technology. You know? yeah. And so it's, it's very interesting. So I reckon there's three problems we need to solve, three big o overarching problems. Hyperbole, paradigm shifts, and futures. All right, hyperbole. One of the things that the internet did was actually expose that there was a lot of inequity. There was uh, a lot of the nastiness we see on the internet has always been there. It's just being targeted at everyone now. So people who have always had the privilege of being the majority perspective or of being um, a majority culture or majority whatever are suddenly being targeted and they're like, oh, this is really terrible. Well, there were a lot of people that felt that way for a long time and were just seeing it. I think the, the concept of normalcy you know, it was a real thing. You know, we had uh, radio and TVs beam into our homes for the last 100 years, the concept of being normal. I think the internet has beautifully demonstrated there's no such thing as normal. And we as a society are having to re-embrace the idea that there's no such thing as normal. And actually, that's not a bad thing. And maybe rather than sort of saying, oh, well, that person did drugs before they started work as a, uh, as a mark against their name, maybe the idea that we are actually a little more complex than that is, is, a, is a thing to, to embrace. So everyone see, sort of starts to seem from, and I know even saying everyone puts me into the hyperbole mode, but <laughs> bear with me, um, it's all unicorns or doom. You know what I mean? Like people are saying everything's shiny and AI is going to fix the world and blah, blah, blah. Or everything's terrible and, you know, social experiment in, in China and it's all going to go to hell. I think both of those are just idiotic perspectives. We need nuance. We need to stop having a learned helplessness when it comes to technology and realise that we actually developed all this. We designed all of these systems, these democracies, these, these constructs, these buildings, and we can design it again. So rather than saying, how are we going to respond to things, mm. we need to start saying, what's the future that we want? What's the quality of life mm. that we want? And we need to look at a values-based approach to designing the life that we want mm. and actually wrapping technology around our humanity rather than wrapping humanity around our technology. And that's a geek saying that. But the second thing I'll quickly say is paradigms. People keep responding to genuine shifts in paradigms with shiny new versions of legacy systems. So we have shifted from a centralised to a distributed paradigm. You can't create a bottleneck. You can't regulate your way out of this either because every organisation that wants to do the wrong thing, every criminal organisation, every nefarious self-perpetuating AI which has no human actor involved is, not go is just going to go to the lowest regulated um, jurisdiction to operate out of. They're going to go on dark webs, they're going to continue doing bad things. So this isn't a, a problem we can just regulate because we've gone from central to distributed. You can route your way around any damage, uh, however you interpret damage. Uh, we've gone from a closed to open system. You know. Can I pull up on the regulation though? Because it is you know, one of our, I know. our, our <laughs> sort of conflict points, if you like. We've got a whole bunch of rules around what our current society provides our its citizens. System, yeah. Okay, there's industrial laws, there's yeah, yeah. finance laws, there's criminal laws. Mm -hmm. Is it right to say because smart tech can get around these laws, we give up trying to enforce them? No, or and again, that's hyperbole. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't do any regulation. I'm saying it's not a silver bullet. Mm. Uh, we can hold people into it and we should absolutely hold government to account. I work in the public sector. I think the reduction in trust and trustworthiness of our public sector and the integration of politics with public sector is part of the problem. If we, we should absolutely regulate how government does stuff, how anyone in our jurisdiction does things. But we need to be realistic that that's not going to solve the problem. It will help, but it won't solve mm. the problem. We have international trade agreements for all kinds of other things. Why don't we have it for things around responsible tech is a, is a question. But the final thing I'll quickly say is, mm. you know, we, we have um, closed paradigms of security, closed paradigms of copyright, closed paradigms of IP, closed paradigms of collaboration. Open paradigms is what, is what going to help this space. And yet people keep trying to come up with clever ways of just repeating 18th century paradigms. Mark? <laughs> I've got a um, whole bunch of questions, but I'd rather hear these two just go at it for a little while. So. I think we'll largely agree on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah no, I, th I think we agree. I mean, the, <laughs> the question of regulation is an interesting one to me, saying, well, you can get around it with the tech. That's, that's, that is likely true. At the same time, it's interesting to me that Facebook, they have a pretty strong content moderation system and team that they use to... I mean, their problems, things get 
through. Of course, there are issues that were raised, uh, you know, when we think of live streaming of violent events, uh, you know, these, these things happen. But at the same time, they are engaged in an ongoing process of trying to control the content that appears on their sites. So it was interesting to me, the, the recent discussion that came up when Mark Zuckerberg said, well, we're not going to fact check uh, mm. political ads. You know, but they'll fact check other forms of ads. Mm. The, they recently changed their system. It was discovered by some investigative journalists, you may have followed this, that you could use Facebook to uh, custom target populations in violation of civil rights legislation. So if you wanted to serve housing ads, you could target by race, which is illegal. That's mm. a protected category. So they went to Facebook and sued them. <laughs> and Facebook had to pay out money. And they also changed the system so that they made it not possible to purchase those types of ads using the f filter terms that mm. for affinity groups. Right. So if, if we're going to get into the level of nuance, I'd probably come back and say, well, it's hyperbole to say regulation doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we've, we've got to think about, um, again, you know, where are the places that it can work, where mm -hmm. are the places that it's, we're going to have issues around it. And, and perhaps, I, I, you know, um, I, we might ask this question about uh, the, I, you know, the whole economy that we've created for mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, uh, you know, when, I, when you said hyperbole, the first thing that jumped to my mind is the promise that, you know, hyper-targeted, customized forms of content and advertising really work. Even work, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've built an, an, an online commercial economy that's premised on this notion that data mining is super effective. You know, it's been demonstrated in some cases to work. Uh, in many cases, it feels like it's just more the magical mm. promise of the data. Mm. Uh, and, you know, what might it mean to imagine an economy that's not premised around that particular form of hyperbole mm. that data mm. mining really works? Uh, can I, just, can I just do a check of the room for a sec? How many people at the level we're having this conversation are following it? Sorry, what do you mean? Excellent. I was just... Because <laughs> it's just a lead into my next question because <laughs> I'm, like, not an expert in this thing. I'm, like, the kid that's blundered into, you know, the intellectual candy store and I get something really exciting, I want to jump on it. And I think one of the challenges for this whole debate is the asymmetry between expert conversation and public conversation. So I'm really heartened you'll put your hand up, so I'm the only one that... But, but I think in short, what P is saying is... Um, I do it in short. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> the, challenge, the challenge is to not go, oh, all bad, pull back but let's define what's good and let's and work towards, work towards it. it. So what, what's happened? Yeah, I, I just, and as an intro on that, Pia, you, you um, had a bunch of idealistic people that work inside government and everyone says, oh, government's part of the problem. We don't want them collecting our data over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years of government 2.0. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to sort of maybe sort of in the context of that, capture that notion of inventing from inside government what is good to give people a little bit of well, faith. Well, I think... Oh, let me just wrap the other point. Sorry. So, um, so just, just really quickly. This is also my attention span too. Sorry. <laughs> so the three major problems, because I remember my third. Um, so hyperbole, paradigm shifts interest. and capacity, right? One, one of the biggest problems, because it goes to your last point as well, is people, like life today has just been faster and faster and faster. Everyone is too busy. Everyone is too busy to read the emails. Everyone's too busy to invest in themselves, to invest in their kids, to invest in their community. No one's got time to read the consent form. Or anything, right? So, so part of the reason why all of those data mining um, things don't work is because no one's got time for that. And we have all these fabulous new technologies. And so we're, we're playing whack-a-mole with problems at the moment. We're saying, here's a problem, whack. Here's a problem, whack. Here's a problem, whack. And the problem is that the, the complexity in the world around us and the challenges and the issues are exponentially growing. Mm. Our ability as a system to respond is linear, little mm. up, little up, down. And what's emerging is an exponential needs gap between what we need to have good quality life, good society, sustainable intergenerational wellness, and our ability to respond. So, so my conclusion, my hypothesis is rather than playing whack-a-mole with the problems as we find them, and rather than taking a, uh, to your point, a, a let's find solutions to the problems mindset, we need to say, actually, we need to design where we're trying to aim towards so we can have a natural convergence across sectors. So inside, outside government, I think, is um, we need to see... We, first of all, we need to separate politics from public sector because a trusted public sector 
that is apolitical and that serves the people, the parliament <laughs> and the government of the day equally, you know, uh, that can be trusted to provide facts into the public domain and actually enable and engage in public discussion about good future policy is a, is a must. And, that, and if we start to see the public sector as a, a semi-permeable uh, membrane, but that it isn't about in, inside versus outside, it's about society and engaging with society to get um, co-developed public policy, to get inclusive design around not just our service delivery, because there's a lot of investment in digital transformation of service delivery in government, but if we saw that investment as a means of engaging in public sector reform, so it can be a, a social and economic platform upon which society can thrive, maybe we'll get somewhere. But that, that seeing government as inside or outside, seeing government as the problem and seeing it as a blending of public politics and um, public sector is part of the problem because then everything loses trust mm. and you've got no foundation for a, a My society. My only pushback, and I totally get that and I'm totally with you, <laughs> but what if the problems are stopping us to imagine and get to the better place? What are the problems? Um, well, for instance, the, the poisonous capacity, nature hyperbole. of our democracy so we can't mediate properly and, and as a society think through problems and, together. And, I mean, so we ran this, this event. So 10 years ago was a thing called the GovTo Task Force Report. How many people here know that? Not many. Ooh, so for everyone else, for you guys. it's worth checking out the GovTo Task Force Report because it was just after the Head of the Game review. Did anyone see the Head of the Game? Okay, a few people. So both reports were looking at public sector reform to make it more ex uh, inclusive, more participatory, more... Um, I mean, they talked a bit about tech in it, but it was about actually engaging humans in the process. Human-centred policy, human-centred services, human-centred government was really the point of Gov2.0. So we did a 10 years since that report, and it, one of the big things that really came out of that, that review was we've progressed in some areas, we've regressed in other areas, new challenges have evolved, but, um, but the, the, there is a, a beating heart. Like, uh, you know, a lot of public servants want to do public good. They are ready. But, but when do you even organise a day like that? Mm. Things like this are rare. Mm. They're, 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 no one's got time to even have the conversation. Mm. So capacity, hyperbole and paradigm shifts are the three biggest barriers. Mark, you've just become part of a group of academics who have got an amazing opportunity mm. to think about the implications of AI. Do you just want to give people a bit of an idea of the scope of yeah. this project, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I, I did. I did also just want to pick up on the oh, point sure. that you, you raised. <laughs> sorry, because I think it's it's such an interesting point. As you can probably tell by my accent, I'm North American, or more precisely, from the U.S. And uh, <laughs> this, um, you know, this question of you know, what you're watching play out now in the U.S. is right some potentially dystopian <laughs> figure of what happens when the notion that there exists a space that's apolitical um, disappears, mm. right? This is precisely the gambit of the, of the Trump administration mm. at the moment. It's to say, no, when, when you try to come at us and tell us factual information, we come back at you and say, that's already politicized. Mm. And that's in a way what's on trial. But Peter's point as I read it is, that atmosphere is facilitated by precisely some of the concerns that we have about the media and information environment that are associated with this digital tech. What is it that makes it possible or plausible uh, to imagine a world in which um, the, the standard systems that we've used to adjudicate rival accounts of what's going on have just broken down to the point that you end up with the inability of groups on different sides of the, of the mm -hmm. political debate to even agree on the most basic, foundational, seemingly neutral facts. Mm. They, just, they just don't exist. And I, I read that with anxiety, the opposite of the all unicorns yeah. <laughs> scenario, as precisely what you're saying. What happens when the media environment gets so poisoned in particular ways that the ability to imagine that structure that you need in order to envision the future is, is threatened. So I, so I watch now what's happening there and I'm, mm. I'm thinking, what will the outcome be? And, <laughs> and that's, yeah. Well, and I think there's something interesting about media and politics are both now rewarded by sensationalism, right? And so those two systems are, are, are growing up, right? They're still in their tweens on the digital, um, you know, maturity scale, as it were. Um, but, and, and I think, so for what it's worth, an example of you know, some, a different approach is um, in the New Zealand government uh, when I was working there and in the New South Wales government when I was working there, 
Um, in both of those governments, we actually, as the public sector, we engaged. We went and said, well, what does a 50-year good look like? And when you engage people across different ideological spectrums in what their good looks like, um, you know, all of them looking at what does a day in the life 50 years hence look like, that was fascinating because regardless of their political spectrums, everyone could agree on some really basic things. And then you could sort of say, okay, cool, let's just park all the things we disagree for a second. The things that we basically agree on, how could we actually bring that about? What role should government play in that? What role shouldn't it play? What role should the public sector? What role should the private sector, et cetera? It gave us a basis across ideological spectrums to have that conversation, mm. which was really interesting, particularly when we started including inclusive design and indigenous knowledge systems into the process. And the most interesting thing for me was the public, the, the quintessential public servant. So there's a guy in, in New Zealand who wrote the intergenerational wellness framework. He's amazing. And so I invited him to give his 50 years good. And he was so funny because he's like, oh, no, no, I'll just present my framework. I'm like, no, present your good. Well, what's good for me isn't what's good for someone else. Well, okay. So we ended up getting into an argument. And finally, he just blurted out, well, Pia, good for me is a situation where, where every citizen has what they need to be able to thrive. I'm like, cool, present that. It was just so interesting. The struggle to articulate it, though, says a lot about where we're up to. It does. And yeah. so... So getting all those, we ended up with 11 50-year futures, right? And they were, they were all over the joint. Um, but, um, but every one of those futures had some basic humanity Is that things. different to Kevin Rudd's 2020 summit? Completely the different oh, because few. the problem with a 5 or 10-year view yeah. is it gives you the status quo and speed and it gives you reactivism to the current problems. Yep. So if you think 50 or 100 years out, again, like indigenous knowledge systems are heaps better at doing than Western knowledge systems, then we have a better chance of, um, of actually planning towards something better. Mm. I'm going to go back to Mark talking about his AI yes. project because it is exciting. It is okay. exciting. Sorry, sorry. I do want, I, 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 I do want to continue <laughs> that conversation. Keep going, but I won't. I'll, I'll talk that's why we're in a bar, <laughs> and if there are things that we haven't finished, you can go and do it. We'll pick up later. Yeah. So, so the title of the center is Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society, and the the premise of this of the center is. Precisely, I think some of the things that we're doing here, which is as we look at these technologies that are going to shape a variety of sectors, uh, and you can already see that the, te that the direction in which a variety of areas are headed, you know, AI is going to play an increasingly important role. Although we don't frame it as AI, we frame it as automated decision making, which means forms of, uh, you know, you don't need an AI to have automated decision making systems. You could have, you know, some protocol in place that just um, uh, you use to make the decisions. But of course, AI is in there. Anyway, the idea is that we need to anticipate now um, to, to do something that it would have been nice if we'd done 10 years ago, which is to imagine what might be the concerns <laughs> Uh, that are associated with the technology that we're implementing, and can we do the work to anticipate them now in order to address them beforehand rather than trying to react to them uh, afterwards? And the the center is focused on four f um, focus areas. So, again, AI is such a big issue. It's you know it would be probably it would be very difficult to to investigate all of the areas in which it's going to play an important role but and it's going to be difficult to even do the ones that, that we've we've pulled out because it's quite broad but we have experts in those areas so um i i think i think we've bit off what we can chew but we'll mm -hmm. see uh you know, the areas in are news and information that's a huge area that's the area that i'm involved in as you can probably tell um the other area is mobility and transport. So the use of automated systems, that's influenced by um, all of the discussion around uh, self-driving cars or some variant or version of, of what it might mean to automate transport systems. It doesn't have to just be that particular vision of a self-driving car. What does it mean to have, for example, smart uh, mass transit systems that can respond in real time to demand and so on? Um, uh, Healthcare, so the role that automated systems will play in a variety of uh, um, forms of... We, we're not looking at, at actually the medical treatment, but we're looking at all okay. of this decision-making processes that surround um, access to and delivery of healthcare, uh, and also social services, so taking a look at the role that automated systems will play um, in government programs uh, in order to provide and track mm -hmm. social services. So it's quite a lot of areas to cover. The mandate of the center is to develop um, fair, inclusive, and ethical AI systems. So to figure out what it would mean, uh, A, what, what types of issues would be raised in each of these areas. Um, so if you think about, I don't know, 
the it, it looks more and more like the uh, version of autonomous cars that that we've been um, inundated with might be a little bit of hype. <laughs> really, um, no Jetsons. So, <laughs> well, who knows? It's hard to say. These, but you know, these these kinds of questions of you know, if you imagine a city where the the traffic system or the traffic light system gets replaced by smart vehicles that are able to um, manage traffic in real time in ways that are more efficient than mm. uh, the traffic light systems could, you know, you you might be able to reduce traffic, but you also might introduce new forms of what if you made that dependent on a commercial platform? You know right away what would happen is that you'd have gra gradations of service. And you could imagine uh, something would be analogous to uh, the end of net neutrality but taking place on the roads. Right? Mm. Right? So, so, you know, whoever pays more gets faster transit. Oh, you get, you <laughs> can buy the green lights. <laughs> you yeah. can buy the green lights, exactly. Oh. You could have tiered service oh. on, a, on a public platform, right? On a publicly subsidized and publicly built platform. And that, that's actually what we see in other realms yeah. of, of, of the development of the tech. So if you can imagine that problem in advance, you oh. can think about ways that you might mm. want to address them in advance. Yeah. So a big part of that center is doing the, the um, kind of brainstorming and theory work to imagine what the problems could be. Mm -hmm. And it's tough, right? There was a yeah. really great discussion today involving Mark and a bunch of union guys. And it started off being about AI and jobs and it ended up actually being about AI and economic models. And it was like this, for me at least, an aha moment. If you're just looking at the endpoint transaction you're missing the big picture yeah? yeah what one of the general paradigm shifts you know around that massive distribution distribution of power of publishing of communications of monitoring you know it's not just top-down monitoring it's sideways and upwards monitoring there's you know we've got massive distribution of enforcement you know people a couple of people with computers and some skills can do things at a scale now never never seen before uh, whether you like or not that's reality uh, every every one of those sort of areas and indeed generally speaking all of the papers I've seen about AI um, and I've been doing a lot of AI work in government talk about how can we as an organisation use AI and automation and things to do the thing that we do onto people. Um, have you been looking at it all um, the, because this is what we started looking at very much um, Personal use of AI, the fact that, you know, people having a personal AI, and this, for anyone that's read it, very much is inspired by Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, P fabulous book, go read it, um, although the last half of it's insane, but the first half's amazing. Um, but personal AI, a personal AI that is, that is mine, that is tethered to me and my interests, that provides a f effectively a, a, a helper and a guide to interface with the world around me means that my personal interface, so rather than mm. every website being WCAG um, compliant, because that hasn't really worked for accessibility, my personal AI presents to me as a voice thing or as a C-3PO or as a, you know, did whatever you is say C-3PO? I did. I'm with that. That would be my helper. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, seeing if I could just slip it in there. But um, my helper then interfaces with the world based on my values and my interests and my preferences. And then it's actually about how markets and economy and governments and private sector makes themselves interfaceable by user-controlled AI? That's a very long question. Yeah. So I do that. Yeah. <laughs> the short answer is we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. um, that I haven't seen that come up in the formulation, but I imagine that it will. Mm. I'll give you an answer, that because I've been thinking about this, that maybe gets to what Peter just said about the political economy. There was a professor at MIT who's since left, but he proposed this type of solution for democracy. And this, this fascinates me. His idea was, well, this is a, this is a long-ranging debate. You know, they debated this in the US, Walter Lippmann and John Dewey. Um, he claims that one of the issues for de democratic societies is cognitive bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you make sense of all of the issues out there? And even more, how can you make sense of all the claims that are being made by the different parties and candidates. And so he came up with the notion of a personal AI that would, would do this for you. I'm setting up the dystopian scenario for you. So the idea is you don't have time to um, master all of the information, and that may be one of the problems for the contemporary political pathologies. What if you had a dedicated AI that could do this for you and that could actually it would learn from your own preferences and your own behavior what your policy priorities are, and mm. then it would be able to go through all the information. Um, you know, I, 
I've had that experience, maybe other folks have, living in the US, I show up, there's all the elections for where I am, from the most local, you know, like dog catcher to president, right? You know, I've done research on some of that, but not all levels. Um, they give you a little cheat sheet when you come in, that, you know, tells you what you might want to vote for. But what if you had a system that could do that, that was tailored to your own interests? That's, that's a really, I, I, I'll cite two interesting questions that come out of that. One is, Who's going to develop the platform? Are you going to program it yourself? That would be cool if you could, but what if you can't? Mm -hmm. And what if Google was providing that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which they are today. <laughs> What's that? So let's just be clear. This exists today, so it's actually about how we respond to it. So how do we respond to the fact that it does it? The second one, and this to me is a, like one of the larger questions that comes out of this whole culture of customization. What does it mean to think about politics in the register of me, 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 right? Mm -hmm. The one that's fostered and promoted by hyper forms of customization of information and messaging. What does it, you know, we exist in a society. We depend on our interrelations with others. What does it mean when that dependence is in a sense masked by the systems that decide what information we're gonna see or be exposed to? Mm -hmm. Those both to look to me like political economic questions. Mm. You know, one is about a commercial prioritization of the consumer over the citizen. Um, and the other is about if these systems are costly and um, you know, information and tech intensive to develop, we can't just imagine solutions invisibly. Like it's cool to imagine the tech that would do this, but you have to situate it in the economic context in which it's going to be developed. Okay, let's do a few questions. You are first hands up. You, you haven't mentioned facial recognition technology and the lack of privacy. It seems that um, this government and all governments, they like facial recognition technology, fights terrorism and, you know, this sort of thing. But it seems it has profound effects for our society. Mm. So what are your views of where we're heading and what are the dangers? <sighs> Um, Are we going to get yin and yang? I, 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 well, no, I think we'll both be in a <laughs> fierce agreement, actually, yeah. in this. Um, again, we're playing whack-a-mole with one entity says we need facial recognition to do something, another entity says not, there's a big debate in the... And then usually we end up going and funding intelligence uh, requests without necessarily evidence. I... <laughs> For my, for my sins, I worked for a politician for a couple of years and I loved working there, but it's certainly not my place because I'm not political and I think politics gets in the way of democracy. That's why I've never joined and probably will never join a party. But what was really interesting was we launched a bit of a, bit of a public furor because we talked about the internet filter as, as being a little bit useless because there was all of the discussion that we just need to capture all this internet, you know, internet information, this, all this browser information, it'll help us solve crimes. And it completely ignored the fact that when you have a block, um, sorry, this is around the, the block, the internet filters are blocking certain URLs, 80% of the URLs that, that they were trying to block disappeared within 24 hours of being on the, on the block list uh, because most bad stuff happens on the dark web. Most bad stuff happens without a URL, which is blockable. Um, and so the entire premise of it as a security thing or as an intelligence thing was wrong and yet still got through. So there's not a nuanced conversation about what good looks like and so everyone just fights out the bad. Um, I think that information like biometrics should belong to the people, should belong to the user. Um, there are absolutely critical intelligence use cases that you know are not going to be about uh, user consent based stuff because there are bad people out there doing bad stuff so we need to have a nuanced conversation about what's genuinely needed for intelligence but if biometrics are being captured by people it, it, and particularly the notion that they should just be used you know, uh, a la carte by any agency, um, I reject that utterly. And I think that what we need is to create the trust infrastructure for the 21st century, which means capturing um, explainability of decisions being made about people, that people then have access to those decisions that have been made about and with them. The onus of proof on a decision made by government in particular should be on government, not on the citizen. Mm. So, so unfortunately, your question leads to a much bigger one, what, how should we be using technology and how do we maintain ethical, dignified, high-integrity outcomes? Well, not by just having a fight on one thing here or here or here, but designing, again, what good looks like and then actually implementing that because uh, just, I'm just not seeing that at the moment. Mark? It's a, I think it's a really interesting and timely question, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm just embarking on a project, actually, that's looking at Australian public attitudes towards 
facial recognition technology. And I, you know, the reason I embarked on that is in part because of the fantasy behind it, which is almost, uh, you know, I'm exaggerating slightly, but almost a completely transparent um, society, mm. right? Like one where wherever you go, you're shedding information about yourself that, be can, that can be collected. It's a, it's a fundamental transformation of the way that we think about public space. We are aware in public that we are not private, but we're not used to thinking about um, the lack of the ephemerality of that not privateness, if that makes sense. You know, people see where we stop, what window we look into, and so on, but that dissipates, it disappears. And the, you know, the, the fantasy of facial recognition is that it won't. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and however, I do think there are some issues about hyperbole here, right? Because most of the trialing that I've seen, if it's, if it's trialed in real conditions, not based on a training set to mm -hmm. see if it works, should demonstrate that the accuracy levels are really quite low, right? Mm -hmm. So the ability that they can be, you know, and that, that has its own dangers, right? So, you know, on the, on the one hand, um, you could say, well, okay, you know, it's, mm. maybe this isn't a technology that we should um, pin so many dystopian anxieties around because it's really not yet you know, ready for prime time. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with that. It looks like it's developing pretty quickly. Mm. What's been interesting to see is the wide range of solutions that it's being put to. Every, if you've know, been following the news, every day there's some new idea about where facial te recognition technology can be used. And the, the way you frame the question is really interesting because I remember seeing, you know, when the legislation for the creation of the, of the um, photo database, the ID database, was first proposed, it was, it was framed as uh, anti-terrorism measure. It's, it's since been framed as an as anti-identity theft measure, mm. or, or both of these things. But and there, also in Britain for um, using it to stop kids accessing porn on the web. That's another oh, one. Oh, yes. That yeah. That's right. We got, a lot of, yeah, we got a lot of publicity for that proposal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, but the, a poll was done of the Australian population. It was a kind of quick and dirty one. But if you frame it as national security, there was general popular support for that. Mm. And of course, the concern about the legislation is that that becomes a way to bring in the tech, but the legislation itself didn't really put a bottom threshold mm. and say, well, it can only be used for this, yeah, right? Yeah. The question became, well, what else can it be used for? And it seemed quite open, which is why they've sent it back. So the interesting question is going to be to see, once they go through this process, where they're going to limit it. But where you see the tech being developed is very much in security and safety environments. That's often treated um, by critics as a way to get the tech in and then habituate people and then think about other possible uses. Mm -hmm. One of the other places you've probably seen some recent coverage is in schools for, mm -hmm. um, for attendance and no. safety and security. One of the things I've observed, so I've been trying to figure out why Australia is the way it is and why it operates in certain ways uh, and how certain things come to be. Uh, and I've looked at a lot of different governments and, and countries around the world. And one of the things I will ob observe, uh, it's hypothesis, is that um, because a lot of our environment, and I'll talk specifically about public sector for a second, um, is compliance-based, you need to comply with the Privacy Act, you need to comply with the legislative requirements, you need to comply with this, comply, comply, comply. We don't have a Human Rights Act. We don't have a legislative requirement to protect dignity. So, so long as you can tick all these boxes over here, you kind of, you know, if you, particularly if you're directed to do something, then you can't really say no. If we had a check and balance, which was, how have you protected the dignity of people? Um, just, you know, however that needs to look, that would actually change things substantially. And to go into countries, to work in public sectors, in some other public sectors, where they start from the premise of, yeah, but how has that helped people? Whereas here, we almost seem to start from the weird premise, and I think it's because we're a penal colony, we almost seem to start from the weird premise of, someone's going to do something wrong, we're going to catch that bastard. <laughs> um, and, and it's not... And isn't it weird that we... It's morally okay for someone to minimise their yeah, tax yeah. but morally corrupt to somehow maximise their entitlement. We are starting from a Hobbesian perspective here. So we either s call it out and say, that's our past but it's not the future that we want, or we're going to continue limping along with this idea of, you know, everything yeah. that we do is effectively trying to catch out some bastard. I like, I'm sorry to swear, I just... So, so in terms of questions from the floor, we've had one question that's taken 10 minutes to answer. <laughs> so it's good. And we've got a whole bunch. So we're going to do speed questions now, and each of you have to answer it in 12 <laughs> words or less. So we're going to do a quick run around. So Hannah's going to do a run around. And ask room. it in 12 words or so less. So questions <laughs> in 12 words or less, and then I'm going to run the hooter. 
<laughs> so, uh, a, lot, a lot of the discussion tonight has been about how um, technology is outpacing people's ability to cope with it. What do you think is the bare minimum of understanding that, indivi that the individuals should strive for in a very complicated area? Which individuals? General people? Yes. The bare minimum people should understand? Yeah. yeah about, uh, 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 how to, okay, critical thinking, self-awareness, how to differentiate truth. Wow. Love it. Okay. Give her a clap. I'll go with that. Mark? <laughs> <How about, laughs> that sounds good to me. What about putting coding in there too? Yeah. Just to see how, the, how things work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one. That was great, guys. <laughs> this is um, I've got a question about the Andrew Yang phenomenon in the United States. So mm -hmm. he's uh, yeah, yeah. kind oh. of really running fourth, fifth or sixth in the US Democratic nominee president presidential nomination race and uh, I'm just wondering whether you know, he's talking about a tsunami of uh, job losses etc uh, resulting from AI and whether that's going to resonate here in Australia yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm not up on Yang's latest <laughs> ideas but um, the question of job losses is I, that's a, that's a complex one in, based on the discussion that we had today, I know I'm going too long, but uh, the, the question would be what, I, I suppose, what policies and structures do we have in place um, that incentivize or disincentivize f um, the automation of the workplace? And we would want to ask, also ask what jobs do we want to automate, right? Um, and and we, we're still operating yeah. on an industrial age 40 hour work week. I mean, we fought hard, you know, people fought hard to get an eight hour work day. Maybe we need to fight hard to get a three-hour workday as the next. You said we're living in an economic model that we need forty hours pay to. Yeah, like we're currently starting from the assumption we need to figure out how to find forty hours work for people every week, um, and I, I would suggest that we need to again go back to capacity. Why don't we have a day, you know, civic? Why don't we have a civic gap year that people can participate in public services or policy? Why don't we have a, a day a week that people are mm. paid? And then, of course, people come back to UBI. That's and great, then, but you have more than 12. Now. Next question. <laughs> How do you go about building a trustworthy artificial intelligence and does that terminology actually mean anything? Ooh. Hey, I love that. Um, we, nothing, should be, nothing should be trusted. Uh, we should build trustworthiness, uh, which means explainability, appealability. Ba basically, if you can't appeal or audit something, then it's not trustworthy. Uh, so we need to build governance models that includes um, non-government organisations in the process. Yeah, it's more than 12 seconds. All right. So we need to build the trust infrastructure for the 21st century. Really good. And, and we may, I think we, do, we need to decide in some cases where and when decisions have to include a human in the loop. Do you think we need a social media ombudsman? No. Ma. I like the idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask about all the people who are left out, which is really rarely discussed. So, um, for example, people who don't have enough money to pay $70 a month yep. for the internet and to buy a really complicated piece of equipment and the knowledge to set it up. Mm. And they go to the library, you know, and are they... And then the only way, for example, to have a say in yoursay.gov.au you know, in act.gov.au is to have an email address mm. and to have the time and mm -hmm. have your own computer and have the internet. And the other thing is disability because, yeah, for yeah. example, last year U3A decided that they would switch everything over to email and there was a huge oh. rebellion. But they, they only went halfway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're an, an old woman, an older person with macular generation mm. and not much knowledge of computers completely left out of that all this and you totally. can't order a Uber cab or Uber food delivery even though you might be the person who yep. most needs them. So and that's just the beginning of disability and yeah. the technological revolution. I am going to take more than 12, sec uh, 12 words. I'm warning you now, but I promise I'll be fast. Okay, um, say them quickly. <laughs> so the first thing is um, we used to have mechanisms to engage citizens properly in policy. We, uh, so New Zealand used to have policy juries, you know, balance, a demographically balanced group coming in, to being paid for their time to, to work on policy areas. You know, we used to do that. Why don't we do it now? Um, so, so more participatory approaches that don't just rely on whoever happens to be online at that point in time, happen to have tuned in, needs to be looked at. Taiwan is doing the best participatory governance work that I've seen in the world. 
uh, and I've written about some of this and I'll share some of those links if it's helpful. From a disability perspective, uh, inclusive design is extraordinary. We're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of great, rather than designing from the centre out and then just appending, 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 actually designing inclusively from the start, from the outside in, gets different approaches to policy, to design, to engagement, to all kinds of stuff. But to your first point, um, there are countries that have established internet access as a human right. And they have made it free and they have made it available, they've made it ubiquitous. I think that is absolutely a conversation we need to have. A very awkward conversation in this country at this point in time, but a critical one we need to have. I agree. Uh, thank you. I, I'm a techie, not a lawyer, so this may be a dumb question because it's, uh, about, it's about regulation. Uh, but I question the assertion that there isn't uh, enough role for legislation. And the thing that occurs to me is that um, we have very well established rules already for what publishers are allowed to publish. Yes. Uh, Fairfax is a publisher, News Corp mm. is a pub I'm a publisher. If I put uh, libelous stuff on my own website, I can be prosecuted. So the question is, how has it, uh, Facebook escaped the classification of being a publisher? Can I, can I just jump in first on this one, guys? 12, 12. So I've got this clumsy analogy that I'm trying to roll out sensitively, but it seems to me that tech has treated our world like we treated or white colonizers treated Australia like it's like a, a terra nullius like these platforms come on and say we're not a media outlet we don't need to subscribe why your laws we're Facebook or we're not a taxi service we're a car riding app that takes people from A to B for money so this this notion I think is part of it is asserting the law of the land on new invaders and I know it's a clumsy analogy but there's something there um, last, you know, I, and, I, and I just want to quickly say in, in acknowledgement, I, I think it's a very... I don't think we should use that analogy because even though it, I understand why it's a clever analogy, it, 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 there's no parity with... There is no parity, but in terms of the know, arrogance I know, I know, I know. and the concept, I think there is a... Yeah. It, it's, it's also logically flawed. Facebook moderates its content. It yes. does do it. Yeah. So it is, it is behaving as a publisher while it's claiming it's not. How does it get away with it? Economic power transformed into mm. political power. But also just awful policies just get implemented by technologists, right? Mm. So I know everyone loves to focus on Google and Facebook as, you know, the big demons. But um, th this is a far bigger problem, right? The gap between policy and implementation in every sector is getting wider and wider and wider and then the, basically the policy people, the decision makers, basically say it's not my fault, it was the implementation fault. Implementation says, well, that was the direction I was given and we're losing that tra you know, line of accountability. Hmm. We had one more question there and then I'm going to do the last question because I thought it up ages ago and I want to do and it. And you didn't even... <laughs> we needed a second drink up here. Hey? Nothing. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. In the interest of accountable government and trust... Does your idea of separation of government and the public sector include a reversal of that prohibition on public servants being engaged in political activity? Sorry, say that again. A, re a reversal of the prohibition. Mm. Of public servants. And you know what's interesting is... So, so of course. Yeah. Um, what's fascinating is that the feds are now out of step with most other public sectors around the world. Um, public servants engaging as professionals online, not just as citizens. As citizens, it should be... We've got two million public servants in this country, when you, which you, when you count them up across every um, jurisdiction. Two million people who there is an assumption oh, that we are somehow civic. lesser than... Huh? Unallowed to have a civic life. Unallowed to have a civic life. Wow. But there's the civics part of it, right? The politics and your personal perspective and being a citizen. But just as a professional, I have literally been told in one particular place, which I won't say... Um, <laughs> Um, that uh, I couldn't say online, I couldn't say publicly what I know, what I'm professional for, what my, I have professional knowledge for, but I'm also not allowed to say what I don't know, but I can say anything else. Um, I literally had someone say that to me. It was fascinating. Um, that means you can share feels. <laughs> free. I can share something else done with you. Um, so um, public servants, and this is, this is critical, public servants engaging online and in the public sphere, in the public domain, as professionals, creates an opportunity for facts to fill the domain, for knowledge to fill the domain, for greater public engagement, mm. for greater policy outcomes, for all the good things. And uh, you can read more about this in my current... Uh, <laughs> no, I've just been series. writing a whole series about this. And one of the articles I wrote was the, the useful balance found in equally serving three masters. Um, there is a long game that the public service needs to serve 
um, not a short game. And so we need to get back to public servants being proud, apolitical professionals and respected as such. Again, she's taking your 12 words. Do you want to say anything on that, Mark, no, or are you good? No, no. Okay, so I'll finish up with this. Um, my favourite TV show of the last decade is The Good Place. Is anyone? <laughs> yes. Anyway, so The Good Place. This woman dies, she wakes up, she's <laughs> greeted into heaven and then she realises she shouldn't be there and then, spoiler alert, cover your ears if you haven't seen it, by the end of season one she realises she's actually in hell. Um, and I'm obsessed by this show and it's in its final season now. I'm so obsessed that I listen to a fan podcast where oh, no. the guy that plays Sean, who's the devil, hosts the podcast and gets members of the crew onto the podcast. And his final question, this is a, but a great analogy, I think, for my experience of the web, by the way. Um, <laughs> but his final question on every episode is simply this. What is good? I'm actually going to repeat what that fabulous public servant said. Good for me is a situation where every single person has what they need to thrive. What they need to thrive. That means not just as individuals but as, as a community, culturally, intellectually, physically, um, has what they need to thrive. And frankly, that then allows for ideological and other diversity, uh, but it doesn't... Um, um, but, but it creates a platform, a platform upon which we can thrive. Mm. Mark, what is good? I agree with that, but to not repeat it, I'll say when it comes to thinking about the tech and the discussions that we've been having, there's been a lot of discussion about ethical AI, um, ethical data. I think what we need to engage in is a discussion about civic and citizen AI and, and mm. democratic data, and we need to rethink the wholesale colonization of our communicative and informational lives by the commercial imperatives that are shaped by the commercial platforms, we need to reshape those and reinvent what we mean by platforms to incorporate civic values and democratic values. And that might mean completely restructuring the economic model, reinventing a different or new economic model, but it means putting democracy and civic life ahead of the imperatives that have been privileged by the mm. platforms. Mm. And, and to, to round off by answering my, quest, my own question, what is good? Good is getting the Australia Institute working in this field. If you want to support them and you've been thinking about donating to them, which you can do online as a small donor, and you care about some of these ideas, donate to the Australia Institute now. What is good is having people like you come out and engage in big debates. This is, it seems to me, and one of, I, I've run lots of campaigns over the years and there are issues you play, there are games you try to win. This feels like more we're trying to change the field we play on. Um, we're losing as progressives. We've got to change the field and it starts with looking at the system that we're working in. So having these discussions is good. Anyone that wants to buy my book, because Fergus came out tonight <laughs> and I asked him what's par and he said selling 20 copies, if you can get me to 20, that will be good. <laughs> you do refer me to me as uh, embarrassingly as the oldest net native we've met. I, well, I, I still, still don't even understand. <laughs> I know, but you've got to read. Thank you, everyone. It's been a really great discussion and um, thanks for being part of it. <laughs> I had a last word. That's been episode 40 of Follow the Money, brought to you by the Australia Institute. It was recorded live on November 20, 2019 in Canberra with Peter Lewis, Mark Andreevich and Pia Andrews. You can find more information about the Australia Institute's newest centre, the Centre for Responsible Technology, on our website at tai.org.au. You can listen free to Follow the Money wherever you get your favourite podcasts, or you can listen online directly from our website. Peter Lewis is on Twitter at Peter Lewis EMC. Mark Andreevich is at Mark Andreevich. That's A N D R E J E V I C. Pia Andrews is at Pia War, as in the cricketer. W A U G H. My Twitter handle is at Ebony Bennett with a double N double T. The Australia Institute is the Oz Institute with an A U S. This episode was recorded live by Clayton McDonald and produced by Jennifer Macy and Lizzie Jack. The theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum, and you can find more of his music at pulseandthrum.com. Thanks for listening.